In this video, we're going to take you through how to get excellence in biology. Biology is probably one of the most content-heavy sciences, if not subjects, you might ever encounter in your study. This can make it feel tricky to ace things when it comes to your exams. Luckily for you, we have some not-so-secret tips and tricks on hand to make you feel like getting an E8 will be a breeze. In the rest of the video, we're going to take you through some strategies and provide you with some great answer examples taken straight from past Level 2 and Level 3 exams. Feel free to jump around using the timestamps below. These strategies will be pretty applicable for every level of biology and will assume you have a good handle on the content and concepts of the standards themselves. If you're watching this and realising this isn't the case, try checking out the study time walkthrough guides alongside watching this. Often in biology, you're working with processes that can feel very small and specific. By this, we mean cells undergoing mitosis or a metabolic pathway are both microscopic in size but huge in magnitude when it comes to impacting the health of an organism. Often when you're reaching for those higher grades, markers want to see not only that you understand biological processes as singular concepts, but also that you know what would happen if the process was altered. This tends to consist of expecting you to unpack what would occur if something, well, went wrong. That's why it's valuable to always put what you're learning right into the context. Have a look at these next steps. Number one, identify what kind of information needs to be included in your answer. Number two, build an answer around definitions in context. And number three, answer your question thinking about the bigger implications of the process. Obviously, to really ace this, you're going to need a bunch of information at your fingertips regarding definitions and the flow of how biological processes tend to work. Have a look at the study time walkthrough guides and checklists to make sure you're armed with all the knowledge you need to write an excellent answer. Once you've done this, it's also expected that you can draw connections between different concepts and processes. Genetics as a topic is so extremely broad that you end up needing to draw on your knowledge of mitosis and meiosis for not only the level 2 genetic variation paper, but also cells and gene expression. In level 3, evolution plays a role in speciation as well as environmental responses, and those happen to be the three so-called different standards. It's amazing knowing your definitions, but for those higher level grades, you need to be able to apply them in an array of vastly different scenarios and be able to justify why what you're saying is relevant. When you're looking at exam questions, you get nice, big, bullet-pointed lists with information you need to include. These often begin with define, explain, or discuss. Learning the difference as to what is expected of you depending on what your bullet point starts with will help you write super coherent answers. Define is provide a definition, explain is unpacking a process or provide some sort of justification, a why in the context of your question, and discuss is think about the implications, what would happen if this changed or what went wrong. To pull all these together, you can use linking phrases to make connections. These can look like this results in, because of this, in contrast to this, this implies, as a result of, therefore, this means, and finally, if this did not occur, then dot dot dot. This is also a great aid in helping you structure your answers in a way that makes sense. It's like we're starting small and then zooming out to examine that bigger picture. Let's apply all of this in the context of a question from Level 2 Gene Expression from 2019. Discuss how mutations can affect the presence, absence, or amount of specific metabolic products in the metabolic pathway for red eye colour in fruit flies. In your answer, refer to the metabolic pathway on the previous page and include a definition of both mutation and mutagen, and give an example of a mutagen, an explanation of how genes influence metabolic pathways, and a discussion of how red eye colour is produced and how mutations to gene 1 and gene 2 in the metabolic pathway can produce colourless eyes. Step 1. Identifying what must be included. In the case of this question, we have been explicitly told about defining mutations and mutagens, but this question revolves around genetic code and metabolic pathways. Even though this isn't explicitly mentioned, including brief breakdowns of these two processes is also important. A mutation is a spontaneous change to the base sequence of DNA, and a mutagen is a factor in the environment that changes the base sequence of DNA. An example of a mutagen is X-rays. Within the DNA base sequence, sections of the DNA code for traits, and these are called genes. 
Metabolic pathways are chemical chain reactions in which the product of the previous reaction becomes the catalyst for the next, specifically with the use of biological catalysts called enzymes. Step 2. Building an answer around definitions and context. Right now, we've defined what we're working with, but we need to connect it all together in the explain section. Genes influence the metabolic pathways because they provide the genetic information that codes for the production of enzymes. If a mutation occurs in a gene, it may not code for the correct enzyme, resulting in an enzyme that may be a different shape or contain different amino acids. It would not be able to carry out its intended function. If this enzyme was a part of a metabolic pathway, it would not be able to catalyse and the pathway could not produce its end product. In this way, genes are able to influence metabolic pathways. We're starting to make great connections now, but we're missing context. When observing the metabolic pathway of fruit flies, it is shown that enzymes PTP synthase and PDA synthase both need to be functional to produce red pigmented eyes. Therefore, a mutation in either gene 1 or 2 will result in the fruit fly displaying colourless eyes. At this point, we've defined and now we've explained. Now we need to discuss. So step 3, answer your question thinking about the bigger implications of this process. If a mutation occurred in gene 1, the PTP synthase enzyme would not function correctly. A buildup of the product GTP would occur without the functioning enzyme to convert it to 6-PTP. Therefore, even if the PDA synthase was produced successfully, it would not have the substrate of 6-PTP to catalyse and the end product of Drosopterin could not be produced, leaving the fruit fly with colourless eyes. If a mutation occurred in gene 2, PDA synthase would become dysfunctional. The product of 6-PTP would build up without the functioning enzyme to catalyse the next reaction, unable to produce Drosopterin and once again resulting in the colourless eye phenotype. For a fly to have red eye colour, genes 1 and 2 need to be free of mutations. This is where the big E grades come in. Those nasty little hypotheticals that get you to start your sentences with if this occurred then or if this did not occur then are often where your grades jump up. Your discussion section is where you must show that you can zoom out and apply your knowledge of what happens when biological processes might go wrong or change. Altogether, this looks like a mutation is a spontaneous change to the base sequence of DNA and a mutagen is a factor in the environment that changes the base sequence of DNA. An example of a mutagen is X-rays. Within the DNA base sequence, sections of the DNA code for traits, and these are called genes. Metabolic pathways are chemical chain reactions in which the product of the previous reaction becomes a catalyst for the next, specifically with use of biological catalysts called enzymes. Genes influence metabolic pathways because they provide genetic information that codes for the production of enzymes. If a mutation occurs in the gene, it may not code for the correct enzyme, resulting in an enzyme that may be a different shape or contain different amino acids. It would not be able to carry out its intended function. If this enzyme was a part of a metabolic pathway, it would not be able to catalyse and the pathway could not produce its end product. In this way, genes are able to influence metabolic pathways. When observing the metabolic pathway of fruit flies, it is shown that enzymes PTP synthase and PDA synthase both need to be functional to produce red pigmented eyes. Therefore, a mutation in either gene 1 or gene 2 will result in the fruit fly displaying colourless eyes. If a mutation occurs in gene 1, the PTP synthase enzyme would not function correctly. A buildup of the product GTP would occur without the functioning enzyme to convert it to 6-PTP. Therefore, even if the PDA synthase was produced successfully, it would not have the substrate of 6-PTP to catalyse and the end product of Drosopterin could not be produced, leaving the fruit fly with colourless eyes. If a mutation occurred in gene 2, PDA synthase would become dysfunctional. The product of 6-PTP would build up without the functioning enzyme to catalyse the next reaction, unable to produce Drosopterin, and once again resulting in the colourless eye phenotype. For a fly to have red eye colour, genes 1 and 2 need to be free of mutations. Do you notice the linking words and phrases? These really help you give your answer some flow and are a really good way to check that you're drawing in the connections that you need to. You've not only demonstrated your knowledge of metabolic pathways as a whole, but you've been able to link them to how genetic mutations actually affect an organism's phenotype. Remember when we said biology was content heavy? 
Sometimes the exam will provide you with a lot of that content. You might get a whole lot of background to a question, and although most of it is necessary for you to write a good answer, it's easy to get overwhelmed or bogged down and forget which bits are the most important to get you the best grade possible. Here's a simple process to break down a big question. Step one, read the question first. Step two, gather relevant information. And step three, use this information in context, section by section. Reading the questions first might especially seem like a super insignificant step, but if you're provided with a scary looking diagram or a big paragraph, you might find it difficult to figure out what's relevant. Unfortunately, if you're gunning for those e-grades, markers won't be expecting you to do your best parrot impression and just repeat what you've been given. You're going to have to extract and interpret the most important parts. Reading what the exam question is asking you is going to give you that all-important direction before you delve into the big pieces of information. Let's look at a level 3 exam question example and work through our steps. The oceanic cricket lives in the Hawaiian Islands. Normal males have wings that produce a chirp when rubbed together. Flat-winged males, on the other hand, have wings more like those of a female, without the noise-making features. Usually, male crickets are known to be noisy when attracting a mate. However, researchers have recently shown that a silent type of the oceanic field cricket, Taliogrillus oceanicus, has evolved twice, independently and quickly, on two neighbouring Hawaiian islands. The chirping sounds of the male cricket not only attract mates on these islands, but also a parasitic fly, or mina orcacea, that can lay its larvae in the cricket, killing it when the young hatch one week later. Discuss aspects of cricket evolution. In your answer, suggest how the flat wing phenotype may have arisen, explain why different locations or have different proportions of flat wing crickets, and discuss what DNA evidence a scientist might have needed to show that this was co convergent evolution and not simply crickets moving from one island to another. Step one, read the question first. Right off the bat, we've been provided with a big paragraph all about crickets, and on its own, it might feel quite disjointed to read. Let's have a look at the question before we get all into that. We can see that we're looking for how a specific phenotype might have arisen, why different locations have different proportions of the phenotype, and what evidence scientists could theoretically use to show convergent evolution occurred. Now when we go back and actually look at what we've been given, we have a handle on what sorts of information are going to be the most important to extract. Step 2. Gathering what's relevant. Let's go back to the big piece of information we've been given to work with. Male crickets have normal and more recently evolved flat wing phenotypes. We also know that the islands on which they are found are neighbouring and that sounds created by normal wings attract a parasitic fly that kills crickets. This is pretty much all we need to know to actually begin answering the exam question. You may have noticed that it'll be pretty easy for you to hypothesize how the flat-winged phenotype arose, but the explain and discuss sections heavily rely on you drawing on knowledge not explicitly given to you in the exam. You'll need to have a handle on concepts like selection, mutations, convergent evolution, selection pressures, and research methodology to determine evolution type. Step 3. Using the information we have been given as context section by section. We have a lot to work with now, so we can begin writing an answer. It's a really good idea to structure it similarly to the order of the bullet points. If we take this into account, we should begin with the how section. The flat wing phenotype may have arisen due to a mutation in the DNA base sequence that affected a metabolic pathway or altering a protein that would otherwise be produced normally. The type of wing phenotype a cricket expresses is dictated by the genetic code, therefore a change in the code would display heritable dif differences in wing shape. It is also important to consider the natural selection that could also play a role in the persistence of the expression of the flat wing phenotype, because the parasitic fly that lives in the same niche as the cricket species provides a form of selection pressure. Flat-winged crickets possess the adaptive advantage of parasite evasion, which would result in a higher chance of their survival in passing on favourable alleles to offspring. We've covered selection and selection pressure, as well as mutations, and we've nicely unpacked and answered that how section. Notice how there's two factors, genetic and environmental, both at play affecting the phenotype. Let's explain why different locations may present with different proportions of cricket wing phenotypes. Different locations have different proportions of flat winged crickets because the phenotype has arisen separately through convergent evolution. 
This means that the same phenotype has been expressed in these different locations, but has happened independently. One mutation in one population did not give rise to the other, rather a mutation occurred separately in both populations, perhaps at a different loci. Therefore, different proportions of the phenotype could be due to one mutation arising more recently in one population. As discussed previously, selection pressure may also play a role in the proportions of flat-winged crickets as one of the locations may have less parasitic flies, meaning that selection pressure would not be as great. Just like that, we've explained the differences in the proportions of the flat-winged phenotype between populations. All that's left is the discuss section, in which we need to talk about what scientists need to confirm convergent evolution has occurred rather than cricket migration. DNA sequencing must be used to determine if convergent evolution has occurred. Utilising sequenced DNA would allow scientists to examine where in the genome the flat-winged mutation lay. In the context of convergent evolution specifically, scientists could discover that the mutation was either different in different populations or similar but residing at a different locus in the genome sequence. Once convergent evolution had begun, scientists could assume that the process was rapid, as the normal winged individuals would continue to be parasited and die, leaving the flat winged individuals to pass on their favourable alleles. The similarities in the phenotype of the crickets demonstrates convergent evolution, along with similar selection pressures in both locations selecting for similar phenotypes because of the existence of strong selection pressure and mortality of the unfavourable phenotype. In absolutely no time we've covered all of the bases, let's put it together. Take special note of how the answer is structured. It follows the natural order of the bullet points within the question, as well as using a lot of linking words and sentence starters to connect the concepts together. These show the markers that you don't see what you're writing about as separate and disjointed, and instead you have a good understanding of how different concepts and processes interact and influence with each other. The flat-wing phenotype may have arisen due to a mutation in the DNA base sequence that affected a metabolic pathway or altering a protein that would otherwise be produced normally. The type of phenotype a cricket expresses is dictated by genetic code, therefore a changing in genetic code would display heritable differences in wing shape. It is also important to consider that natural selection could also play a role in the persistence of the expression of the flat wing phenotype, because the parasitic fly that lives in the same niche as the cricket species provides a form of selection pressure. Flat winged crickets possess the adaptive advantage of parasite evasion, which would result in a higher chance of their survival and passing on favourable alleles to offspring. Different locations have different proportions of flat-winged crickets because the phenotype has arisen separately, through convergent evolution. This means that the same phenotype has been expressed in different locations, but this has happened independently. One mutation in one population did not give rise to another. Rather, a mutation occurred separately in both populations, perhaps at a different locus. Therefore, different proportions of the phenotype could be due to one mutation arising more recently in one population. As discussed previously, selection pressure may also play a role in proportions of flat-winged crickets, as one of the locations may have less parasitic flies, meaning that selection pressure would not be as great. DNA sequencing must be used to determine if convergent evolution has occurred. Utilising sequenced DNA would allow scientists to examine where in the genome the flat-wing mutation lay. In the context of convergent evolution specifically, scientists could discover that the mutation was either different in different populations or similar but residing at a different locus in the genome sequence. Once convergent evolution had begun, scientists could assume the process was rapid, as the normal winged individuals would continue to be parasited and die, leaving the flat winged individuals to pass on their favourable alleles. The similarities in phenotypes of the crickets demonstrates convergent evolution, along with similar selection pressures in both locations selecting for similar phenotypes because of the existence of strong selection pressure and mortality of the unfavourable phenotype. You might have picked up on how we didn't focus all that much on the big chunk of info we got given at the start of the question. We needed it for some background information and context, but when it came to writing our answer, we were almost exclusively drawing on prior knowledge of the concept that had not been given to us inside the exam question. That's exactly the skill you need to hone those E8s, being able to correctly use the background you're given to draw on various relevant concepts. That wraps things up. We hope this was helpful, and we'll once again remind you to check out the subject checklists and walkthrough guides if you feel like there's a gap or two in the concepts you might need to know. 
Remember to use those important linking phrases and learn the differences between define, explain and discuss so you can be sure you're writing a fully formed excellence level answer. You totally have this in the bag. Good luck.